The idea of the film is for people who understand the social model, understand about structural inequality and discrimination, but maybe don't understand the particularities about hearing voices. More about the kind of lived experience and the re, you know the realities of of um, the history of the group and and people's you know lived experience. The first group I went to was actually in Sheffield, but the important point of it was it led me to the Hearing Voices Network, which is very important. I went along and I, at that time I was the archetypical schizophrenic. I was scruffy, I didn't wash, I didn't shave, I was scruffy. And what struck me when I first went, there was 10 other members there, but they're all smart and presentable. I remember thinking, well, he can't be schizos, he should be scruffy like me. But he started to share their experiences, and I'm sure people, you've probably heard this before. It was a liberating experience. I wasn't alone anymore. I could take this mask off I've been wearing for years. And I went for a while, then they said, would you like to go to a workshop? And I didn't even know what one was. I turned up at St. Matthew's Church Hall thinking, well, where, where's the benches? What are we going to make? Then. Just through that meeting, it was, it was a while later that I contacted the, the Hearing Voices Network. For me, it was, it was the biggest turning point in my life and my recovery, I think. I met so many so many amazing people that are here today. Through the confidence I've given from the Hearing Voices uh, Network, it's now the longest running group in the world in this country. We set up a group in Sheffield. It is that, you know, and I, that it, in general, the Hearing Voices Network has somehow taken off across the world. It started, more than it started in England, and uh, there was a lot of vibrancy down there, you know, big, influence of this is Paul Baker. He got he got Marius over here. I think that's part of history we should never forget. And I travelled the world over to Australia and America and they are where we were in the nineties now. So you hear a lot about the enthusiasm there. And that's why I think uh, the group that Paul set up and what Ruf Rufus is running in Bradford as well in the Sheffield group, it needs to come back to collectively. I'm not saying we, should, we shouldn't have an head office in London. If that's where they want it, that's fine. But I think the history is with Manchester. Um, I, think, I think there's a misconception that you're going to change services from the outside. You can't. You've got to change from the inside and the outside. It's got to be the collaboration. So I think you've got to move with the times. I think that, that's, the, that's the important thing. You need to get services involved, not, not take over, but to in, in, endorse the mastery, uh, sorry, the, the hearing voices movement approach. just wanted to add on to what Peter was saying, um, the point that you made, Tony, about um, why we hear about so much more success stories from like Brazil and, and different countries around the world. I've been thinking about this loads recently. Um, and I think part of it is, and this isn't a good, this isn't the way that it should be, but countries with privatised healthcare, which, and without a national health system like we have, um, the sort of flip side of the problems of that is that one rich donor can suddenly give a hundred thousand dollars to build a center based on whatever principles possible. Um, two things. I think so, there's quite a lot of activity going on in England and, and, and the UK, UK generally, but it's very much local groups, which are a little bit fragmented and separated. And inevitably groups have kind of life cycles, you know, like it's usually somebody who's really in involved in it. And maybe if that person moves on, maybe the group, the moment, you know, and, and we, we need to sort of like restart that energy. I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, there's a lot of understanding about the hearing voices approach. We just need to get back on top of it. And so one of the things we'd like to do 
going forward is to relaunch the Northwest Hearing Voices Network and get busy with services around, uh, you know, and, and, and the community generally and all sorts of people hear about voices. Um, I think the thing that we need to recognise, though, is that one of the big things that happened in um, this country was probably hearing the voice, the University of Durham project, which is a multi-thematic kind of anthropological, historical, religious, psychological look at look at hearing voices from a very holistic perspective, because yeah, they put on an exhibition, for instance, which went around the country. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I feel that we, we kind of like, started this thing you know we were like the fire starters but you know you've got to keep the fire going and um I and mean, i think we just need to sort of re-energize our connections with each other and introduce the whole network. i think that the, the hearing voices network in the uk is seen as a sort of internationally as something that's really happening in the uk more so than other countries it's often quoted when you come to america but the hearing voices network is really strong in the uk we shouldn't underestimate what we've got really i don't think and there's always room for development, and there always is, and that's sometimes all we see. But I think it's important to recognise that we have got a really sort of strong movement in this country. Yeah, I, I came across the Hearing Voices Network not as a voice hearer, but as a uh, professional, um, as a psychologist uh, who's recently qualified. And I'd been psychotic when I was 18 um, and been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I was wanting to find a space to bring those two different experiences together, my training and practice as a psychologist and my personal experience. Of, and the values of the network that really, I guess, made it feel like a safe place, like a kind of coming home, like, like Peter described, um, were this kind of, that everybody, that your, your experience was meaningful. And that it was interesting and it was something where that everybody's experience of, of voice hearing or unusual realities is has got lots of possibilities has got uh, meaning and needs to be respected and listened to because i've done a psychology degree expecting that uh confusion and confused mind states whatever we want to call them, would be, you know, approached with curiosity and seen as meaningful. But I hadn't, that hadn't been my experience. It'd been We've got a group in Bradford. It's not been long, running as long as uh, Peter's, but it's been going about 16, 17 years. Um, and, yeah, it's had some spin-offs. There are, there are about three or four groups in Bradford, I think. So, yeah, I don't think the network is as cohesive as it was but that's partly because of funding and i think local organizing locally is sometimes more easy than organizing nationally i think most networks struggle on a national level because we're, we're naturally more regional beings than, than you know it's too big sometimes to organize on a national level i think I think for me, I, I got, I'm similar to Rufus in a way that I'm not a voice hearer, but I was really drawn in by the voice hearing approach when I saw Pete and Rufus um, speaking at UCLA, UCLA and we saw Rufus's documentary and Pete came and spoke. And it's just the sort of, the way things are normalised and humanised and seen as part of a process that is intrinsically sort of themselves and who they are. I think was really important for me at the time and sort of totally transformed the way I view things about the medical model in terms of, because before that, that's, that's all I'd known really. And it really struck me that there was a profound truth in this and it has gone on to sort of engender itself in my recovery. I, I don't know how I would call without it, to be honest. I'm going to ask you a question, Rufus. Um, going back to what I was saying about changing from the inside and the outside, uh, I remember you contacted the network, uh, telephone made a telephone call initially um but i guess it, it, it was very it was quite well not quite it's very brave to come out in the profession that you've got uh but that's what we need people to do to change from the inside but in, in essence you put your career on the line didn't you for, for the, the passion of the movement yeah and sometimes yeah it's been pretty pretty dicey <laughs> but uh yeah i guess it's been worth it definitely um and 
there wasn't much of a there weren't many role models yeah so mm -hmm. you, didn't, you didn't really know and I, I tried to wait till I proved myself professionally so that people couldn't doubt my competence um, and that's hard when you have to keep things secret we want a, a more open society where we value people's experiences and, and more supportive when people are vulnerable trainees of all mental health professions often have to feel they have to hide their vulnerability sometimes and I think it'd be nice to be more supportive mm -hmm. as a society and value you know there's value to sensitivity yeah I think it's, it's important because I think there's a misconception it's probably especially around psychiatry if you hear voices and you get a diagnosis of schizophrenia you can't be intelligent and academic yeah but it, it's, it's total nonsense total yeah. nonsense yeah. But, but what about when you always did think the doctor heard voices? I mean, that's when he went out, he became very public um, about, and it kind of created a kind of whole debate, didn't it? Or even, a, even a, there was a, was it, was it ethical? Was it appropriate? You know, the whole way that you, I just wonder if you'd like to tell us about, because that was the first time I think in this country we had a big, you know, like a film or a documentary, like, or, or, or not even a documentary, it's half acted and half real. But it was a really interesting exploration of the issue. And I wondered, what was that like for you when you went public? It was about, for people who haven't seen The Doctor Who Hears Voices, it's a documentary where a filmmaker followed me for a year and he focused on one person that I tried to help independently, voluntarily tried to help. Her. And it was a junior doctor who heard voices um, and didn't feel like if she told her doctors that she would lose her job so she was already suspended for depression and my job was to try and help her get more stable um and without um losing her job uh, it crossed a lot of different taboos the the film i think um so it was it was very challenging um and some journalists really hated it and people either loved it or hated it i think some journalists sort of questioned my um, sanity <laughs> as uh, you know, um, disturbing, if not disturbed, one journalist said. And another journalist said they wanted to punch me in the face. So it really challenged our society likes to see doctors really as, you know, they're the new priests of society. They're the ones we trust. So the film was kind of questioning that and saying there, there could be another position on this and that sometimes doctors might be too heavy-handed with medication and not collaborative enough and that was very challenging to the status quo and I, I've done very little media work since. <laughs> For me um, I was really struggling with my voices and I'd been described as a open door patient and the services at the time were only offering me medication you know that was the the, the get fixed quick thing supposed to be, but medication wasn't helping me. And it was my health visitor. She was the only professional that listened and understood. And she said to me, um, Kate, I've been looking on the internet and I found this uh, network called uh, the Hearing Voices Network. And she said, it's a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. She, she said, well, this is the same way that the Hearing Voices Network work. She says, it's voice hearers that have got their life back and they help people like you get your life back, and they do a group. And I remember going, oh, please refer me, please refer me. And she said, well, that's the beauty of it, Kate. You don't need to be referred. And I remember that Friday in Manchester and Lever Street going to the group, and I went in and I was like, oh, my God, it's not just Scottish people that hear voices. English people hear it. Um, and when I joined the group, I was really scared, don't get me wrong. I thought, as I say, I was the only one that heard voices. But I felt I kind of liberated to sort of meet other people who shared my experiences. You know, there were stories that were like mine. And I was like, oh, my God, these people are just like me. So I started to go every week. And the people in the group were so patient, kind and empathic with me um, as I... I struggled to um, to explain my voices because I thought nobody will understand, nobody will listen, nobody will want to know because in the medication sort of thing, they'd say, oh, Kate, it's all in your head, you don't really hear it. But then it's hard to trust people as well. So after a while I go into the group 
I started to trust people again and I felt like I could re remove that mask that I was wearing. And love was something I was never shown as a child. But here I was attending the group. And then I'd say after attending the group for months, I was asked if I'd like to co-facilitate the group. Um, and then eventually came the facilitator of the group. And this was something that I was really proud to do. Yeah. So I, I met Stephen at a different different group one a bit like like AA and he told me that that they had a centre in in Hume and I came along the once and I really enjoyed it I, I like getting insight into what's been said about me by the the psychiatrist and you know that's not always accurate and you can sometimes I feel like there's a bit of like a a negative spin on on the state of my mind and you know I try and overcome that by learning and being a bit more positive about it and you know most most of the 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 best i've i've gone out of it is through helping others understand them themselves as well and you know having conversations and stuff that's what i like about the network is this idea that we've all got wisdom and that there isn't people with more or less that we've all got it and it's, you know in some situations you'll have more wisdom than that psychiatrist in other situations, maybe he'll he'll have more wisdom about, you know, how to prescribe. In a bit of a weird place um, regarding my uh, condition, um, it's been a really difficult couple of weeks, um, which has kind of forced me to reevaluate how I'm managing some of my symptoms and um, as been a bit of a call to action really um you know i think one issue that i've had in particular which is kind of being chipped away at now is this fear of feeling relaxed um which is my therapist he gave it a name i'm not sure if i am going to say it right but he called it something like a positive uh, positive affect um which is just a fear of feeling relaxed, really, and, and letting my guard down, um, not getting an awful lot back from the voice. <laughs> I'm definitely saying a lot to the voice, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm kind of, um, yeah, getting there. For me, you know, one of the main challenges I've had with the hearing voices experience has been the stigma around it and the, the anxiety and the and the kind of shame and the guilt that came with that has actually been more difficult than the actual hearing of the voices themselves and I think you know the group just gives me an opportunity to you know be in a space where it's normalized and it's um you know and I can speak about it because well I too have been very impressed with the uh First approach, first of Narcotics Anonymous, and then Narcotics Anonymous. When I was um, trying to um, avoid hospital appointments to keep them in depots, I found the support of going to Narcotics Anonymous really good because there are a large number of groups and you can get, go to um, the miracles how people have totally transformed their lives. And I think that something similar can be done with mental illness. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, again, anybody else who hasn't had an opportunity to say how they first got involved in the Hearing Voices group and wants to share? You have to forgive me. My heart is beating very fast because I have never uh, spoken to a group about my own experiences. Um, so I've never found the words <laughs> put together in the right way. Um I've had psychosis and been in mental health hospitals and stuff like that since I was, well, my whole life, really. Um, and I always disagreed with the medical model, but hadn't sort of found a kind of way to think about that properly. Um, I've always worked in statutory or safeguarding services. So I was a um, young offenders worker, youth worker, um, always felt that I've had to hide um, my mental health history and labels and current state from uh, anything I've been professionally involved in. I worked Definitely. with young people who had diagnoses of things like schizophrenia and the misunderstanding and judgment from the staff was just horrific, um, really awful. 
Um, I then maybe in start of 2018 got very physically very ill, became very uh, suddenly very disabled. So that changed a lot of things. Um, but for some reason, having to accept the label of disabled uh, and speak publicly or be public in some way about the physical health problems because it was unavoidable um, made me feel a bit more confident about being a bit more open about mental health in settings that I otherwise wouldn't. Um, how, and so I'm trying to, this is me trying to do um, professional hearing <laughs> voices um, advocacy and also as a person who has those experiences and doesn't always know what, what to do with them. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. I feel very, really privileged. Thank you. There's also um, the Terry McLaughlin PhD that he wrote um, for Manchester Metropolitan University some years ago now, which was um, some of the early days of uh, the Hearing Voices Network and his involvement in it. Um, which um, Paul and I managed to rescue. Um, Manchester Met Library had that lost it completely and, and didn't seem that bothered about, you know, ever trying to find it again. So Paul and I found his retired supervisor and we got from him some computer disks and we recreated his PhD thesis from, from those disks. And it's a very interesting one. The first 190 pages is... I can't read it. I mean, it's kind of so theoretically <laughs> political, blah, you know, postmodern reconstructed whatevers. But it's like, you know, it's almost like two people voted because he gets page 196 and all that stops. And then he says, and then we sat down and had a really good meal and had a song down the pub and blah, and, and Ron's written a song and here it goes. And, you know, so I think, you know, Anyone reading it, if you get put off by the first page, you're in good company. Just flick through until you get to, you know, because there's a really nice kind of story there. And and I think there's something, like you were saying, that, that you kind of find your community. You know, and I think disabled people find that, that very often within a family, within a village, within where a school, you know, they're special, they're different, they're you know, kept indoors when everyone else goes outdoors, all of that goes on. And then you find your community and it's like, wow, you know, it's, it wasn't just me and, you know, someone else can finish my sentence and it doesn't sound strange, you know, and all of that, you start to go flipping it. Interesting, um, Tony. Uh, I was very close to Terry McLaughlin in those first 190 odd pages. He wrote that way deliberately. Um his external examiner was Marius Rom. When Marius read it and he said, this is nonsense, it doesn't make sense. So Terry said, read it again, Marius, but look at it through the eyes of the general public. Then Marius got it, he's wrote it that way, because like the first hundred pages are how people would see the Hearing Voices movement. It's nonsense, it doesn't make sense. But then you have to read it all to get the real context of it. He's saying, don't judge it on the first, what you see, you've got to look at the whole thing. So he wrote it deliberately that way. Sorry, where can we access that to have a look at it? I'm hoping Paul's got a copy, but if not, um, I'll, I, I'll email it to Paul again. And then, because I'm respecting people's privacy. Um, from then, being a youngster, you know, it's like I heard voices, had unusual experiences, um, but I never thought that that was anything abnormal. And um, I, I can say, thank God I didn't relate. It's like voices and trauma in my life. Um, because I think I may have ended up, it's like um, in the in the system as such. And I was very fortunate that it's like I had voices and maybe it's like I resolved a lot of issues there of quite a lot of trauma. And I was a curious soul who wanted to know where the voices came from, but more importantly, why the voices were there. And that journey took me eventually into spiritualist churches where perhaps it's like I still didn't get the answers I was looking for because there were those who believed that their experiences had a spiritual basis to them and that what they experienced was something that was outside of themselves. And so the premise being that an individual wanted to speak to another voice hearer 
who also shared a belief in some greater purpose or of an experience that was a divine or spiritual awakening experience for the understanding, for the acceptance that was the foundation to the expansion of all HVN groups. It was its cornerstone. And from that came a, a fraternity amongst individuals. And then the groups could expand and other groups were inspired. So everything has been said here is absolutely correct. And it's lovely to hear it all. And, but we do need to get back to the sort of grassroots as well, which is reaching out to people, to voice hearers. Yeah, I'm just it's sort of echoing what Carol's saying about reaching out to people. I think this is the, the major task of the Hearing Voices Network to get people believing in the approach. Uh, I think that that can happen within the system as well as outside. And I think the developments that are happening at the Psychosis Research Unit in Manchester, uh, talking with voices research is really a way of getting that sort of agenda established. Um, I see it as a support network and um, a way of, I suppose, talking therapy in some ways. Um, there's a there's therapeutic nature to the group that, um, that the community holds. So there's a therapeutic atmosphere that's going on, which you don't necessarily get in a medical model. Find, finding a, a, a cause for that energy that is so... Um, infinite and sort of uncontrollable within this world um it's a slow process to integrate so it's taken me five years to integrate all of those things into this one life um and then from a medical view the medical view is is as old as me it's 34 years old um 36 years old um it, the legislation came in the year i was born um, strangely, and um, it, it, I think the dated legislation is the problem and, and can feel quite oppressive, but this is um, a group that feels so um, so warm and so um, inviting and um, understanding that it, I think it's the future of mental health. It's about getting to know each other as people and human beings and valuing each other. I think that's such an important part of what we try to to create in, in groups. And even though Zoom is challenging, because it's all one dimensional, um, we've managed to keep this going for over six months now, which I think is amazing. Yeah.